The year before the Uvalde massacre, the gunman had already earned the nickname School Shooter. It was a running joke among those he played online games with. And those who knew him best say he was already making graphic threats of violence. Investigators now believe the gunman had never shot a firearm before the day he killed 19 students and two teachers at Robb Elementary School. A tragic plan he was able to carry out because of, quote, systemic failures and egregious, poor decision-making by hundreds of police officers on the scene. That's according to a new report on the Uvalde shooting released by a state house committee in Texas. The 77-page investigation puts the lie to what Governor Greg Abbott said about the police response on the day after the massacre. But the reality is as horrible as what happened. It could have been worse. The reason it was not worse is because law enforcement officials did what they do. They showed amazing courage by running toward gunfire for the singular purpose of trying to save lives. We now know just how wrong Governor Abbott was. As footage from inside the school showed, police actually retreated for cover when the gunman fired at them from a classroom. The new House report says that police lack clear leadership and basic communications from the 376 officers on the scene who responded from dozens of agencies. It was a chaotic crisis response, poorly commanded by the school district police chief, who says he thought he was dealing with a barricaded subject alone in a classroom, not an active shooter surrounded by school kids. The report details a series of errors by the police in the 117 minutes that elapsed between when the school shooting started and when the gunman was finally killed. But it also called the elementary school to task for keeping doors unlocked and not following its own active shooter guidelines. And it detailed how the troubled gunman obtained his weapons just a week after turning 18 and how local authorities received no notice that he had bought those weapons and family and friends missed or ignored signs of what he was planning. But the report laid out how this problem is also bigger than Uvalde. It said, quote, We acknowledge that those same shortcomings could be found throughout the state of Texas. We must not delude ourselves into a false sense of security by believing that this would not happen where we live. The people of Uvalde undoubtedly felt the same way. So here's the question. How do we hold police accountable for such massive failures? And how do we keep guns out of the hands of potential school shooters without violating individual rights and further stigmatizing mental illness? Joining me now are MSNBC law enforcement analyst Carmen Best, who served as the chief of Seattle's police department from 2018 to 2020, and James Densley. He's a professor of criminal justice at Metropolitan State University and co-founder of The Violence Project. Welcome, y'all. Carmen, I want to start with you, and I want to go back to Greg Abbott praising the police response the day after the shooting, because a lot of Americans see people of color, for instance, killed by police officers, and they hear uh, cops respond that this is the price of vigilance, of the thin blue line that protects civilian lives. Uh, and yet on that day in Uvalde, that thin blue line crumbled. And since that time, it looks like people in law enforcement have been trying to protect themselves. What would real accountability for these failures look like, in your opinion? Well, there's, it's so hard to begin with just the one debacle after another with this whole entire incident. One, the, the response to the lack of uh, information that was forthcoming, and then the way things are just dribbled out little by little. Um, there will be many more reports beyond this one evaluating and reviewing what happened there. There's going to have to be some accountability here. Everyone knows what the training is uh, to go in, to uh, stop the threat. Uh, to put yourself in harm's way so that you can protect the lives of others. You know, officers are sworn to do that. I myself have been sworn to do that and have faithfully tried to do those things. And 
I, I want to say before I go further is that, you know, every day there are thousands of officers who do, in fact, follow the training and put themselves in harm's way. But it didn't happen here. And that is a question um, they were just going to have to try to figure out why. The lack of leadership, the lack of taking responsibility, the lack of command. That's why we have um, training. Usually there's mutual aid training. You train with other agencies. You understand the protocol so that when the real thing happens and the real event occurs, there is a set set of standards and procedures that is followed. And that just didn't happen here. And James, uh, the report also noted that the shooting suspect had f failed out of school. He was texting online friends about his plans uh, and got help from family members to pick up the $6,000 worth of rifles and ammunition he bought after he turned 18. So how does this square with what you've learned about other school shooters? And, you know, what would a successful intervention have looked like in this shooter's life? Uh, you know, how could that or should that have happened? Yeah, we often see in the lives of mass shooters and school shooters, they have four things in common. They have early childhood trauma. Well, in this case, this was a mother struggling with a long history of drug abuse. And also a former girlfriend that claimed that the shooter actually reported having suffered from sexual assault at a very young age at the hands of the mother's boyfriend. We also see that there was bullying uh, throughout the fourth grade in particular that seems to be particularly traumatic for the shooter. Now, secondly, they reach an identifiable crisis point. In this case, the report outlines that this person was recording more than 100 absences from school. That's a noticeable change in behavior. You'd think that would be an opportunity to intervene in this case. He also reported to a past girlfriend he didn't think he would live beyond 18, either because he would take his own life through suicide or that he just wouldn't live very long. And suicidal ideation is something we do see in the life histories of mass shooters, too. Another thing here, he was online and online studying school shootings, obsessed with school shootings, and also demonstrating a lot of aggression toward women and a violent sort of tendency here, which again should have been a red flag. And then as you mentioned uh, at the top of your question, three months prior to the attack, this is an 18 year old, by the way, was purchasing armor, 60, 30 round magazines, and ammunition on the day of the shooting arrived, 1,700 hollow point uh, bullets that arrived to his house, in addition to the assault style weapons that he was purchasing. On all these levels, there are opportunities for intervention because you should be intervening early in life with childhood trauma. We should be intervening with the crisis point when someone's missing school or talking about suicide. We should be intervening when someone's going tumbling down the rabbit hole and stunt studying these school shootings on the internet. And we absolutely should be intervening when you've got all those warning signs and red flags, and then you're purchasing that much ammunition and that sort of high powered firearms at 18 years old. So lots of missed opportunities here, and it's common in the lives of these school shooters. And Carmen, you know, the report also took pains to praise most uh, police officers and teachers as dedicated public servants. And you pointed this out a, a moment ago. But it also says, you know, don't say that this was the failure of one local police ch chief. This could happen in any number of communities. Uh, how, how prepared or unprepared are most of our uh, police forces for mass shootings? And what else should they be doing to prepare? Right. Well, of course, they're right. that It could have happened anywhere, potentially, but it didn't. It happened in Uvalde, and that's where we're looking at uh, to determine what things got missed there so that they don't get missed elsewhere. I have to tell you, I'm, I'm pretty perplexed by it all. I mean, the training since Columbine has been relatively consistent all across the country about going in, about uh, having a team, uh, and going to the threat to end the threat and to save the lives of young people. Unfortunately, in this country, we've had so many school shootings and mass shootings um, that we've become pretty expert at what we need to do uh, in response to them. So I, I believe that the vast majority of agencies 
are well trained and understand what to do in these circumstances. That's why there's such a high level of confusion as to why no one took charge, no one set the tone, and no one went in uh, to sooner to save those young people. And James, I think a lot of people, you know, they wonder, okay, um, how do you intervene with somebody that you think has these red flags uh, without also infringing on their personal autonomy and, and further stigmatizing mental health issues? Because there are a lot of people with mental health issues that, that are not going to go and commit, do not commit this kind of act. How do you strike that balance in a real world way? Yeah, it's a very sensitive balance, and you're right. We don't want to stigmatize because the vast majority of people with a mental illness, for instance, are more likely to be victims of violence than they are offenders. I think what it comes down to is really building systems in schools, in workplaces, in our communities where people are collaborating and talking to one another so that all these different pieces of the puzzle get put together. Because time and time again, what we see is that somebody knows something, whether it's a parent or a colleague or a, a classmate or a police officer, but nobody's talking to one another. It comes down to having better reporting mechanisms, reducing the stigma for reporting, because people are worried that if they report, they're going to get somebody in trouble and mm -hmm. there's going to be a punitive response. So you don't want to be a snitch. You've got to break down those barriers to ensure that people feel like they know they're helping somebody as opposed to getting them in trouble. And then it's making sure everybody's talking to one another and that there are robust mechanisms in place to get them connected to the services they need. This is the other failure here is that we don't have some of the resources that are necessary because they've been defunded over generations. Uh, hopefully, we now might see some movement to getting people the help they need, getting them the resources, and getting it properly funded and stood up so that this doesn't have to happen again.